and once again the horrific tales. Before again, do me a favour and uh, like and share these videos, try and help get as much exposure as possible. Uh, be greatly appreciated as well if you just take a second and show support to our artists. As you know, they very kindly uh, share their talents, their time and their efforts with this show. Tonight's sale is no exception. A simple purchase by a gun enthusiast unlocks a whole series of memories and opens up events that's from a previous time. It's my pleasure to share with you Heaven's Repeating Echo, written by Chris Bowler. Columns of grand rebar spiralled at the storefront windows. The dirty glass cast a polluted sky over his view of the barrels, which were lined up like smokestacks. Jim shuffled left until he could see farther back along the wall. It hung like a stuffed marlin, with a small frame beside it, which he figured was coated with as much dust as the windows, and probably read something like, Evans Repeating Rifle, 1870 something. Not a fucking chance, Jim. James Camden wasn't the type to admit such things. Bringing that rifle home would soothe an ache he had felt come and go since he was a child. Seeing it again was like a bad knee flaring up before rain. It called to him, imprisoned behind glass and bars. Can I help you? The voice spoke as dazed. Jim spun to a tall man with a rifle case. His eyes were dark and unsettling, set deep between shiny, knobbed cheekbones and a brow that jutted forward as if the skin on his face was pulled tight against his skull. I heard you had an Evans repeater. Jim's finger and body turned to the window. When he turned back, the store owner's expression hadn't changed. The man's pupils were swallowed up in his irises. They made Jim feel cold inside. The skin on the man's neck and wrist were thick and scarred with the frozen meat colour associated with severe burns. Jim's eyes dropped under the man's gaze. His tone was fragile, teetering and cracking. I'm Jim. Flynn. The store owner looked at Jim's hand for a moment before he shook. Jim figured he could probably loosen the lug nut with his fingers. Flynn motioned for Jim to follow. After fumbling with his keys, he held the door and a chair welcomed Jim across the threshold. Motes floated through the light from the open door, like embryos of ghosts. After the lights came on, Jim walked straight to the rifle, welcoming the familiar scents of hops number no. 9 and lubricated metal. The sign beside the rifle read, Evans Repeating Rifle. 1877, new model. A friend of Wild Bill claimed he'd shot the eyebrows of his wife with one of these, Flynn said as he stepped beside him. His arms were crossed. They both appraised the weapon a moment. Jim turned his eye to the strange man, whose body and interest were oriented on the weapon. He used to shoot coins out her little fingers. The side of Flynn's lips curved while he talked. Only the precursor of a smile, but it struck Jim as a piece of history Flynn was fond of. May I see it? Flynn shrugged and went behind the counter to get the rifle. Jim turned the weapon in his hands and ran his thumbnail over something in the wood. Leaps and fire was etched in the wood. Jim stared at Flynn with his mouth open. Just a coincidence. Flynn was amused with the connection, however. Jim turned the repeater in his hands, noticing the dings in the metal and scuffs in the walnut. He didn't mind a girl with stretch marks. Bringing the stock to his shoulder, adjusting his fingers and breathing, he flipped the sight and took a shooter's stance. He closed his eyes and exhaled. When he opened them again, a man stood in his field of fire, naked and dark with blood, save the bulging whites of his eyes. Shit! Jim nearly dropped the rifle. He looked over at Flynn, who had canted his head and raised an eyebrow. Did you see that? He pointed where the man had stood. Flynn looked across the street and back at Jim. Are you alright? Yeah said Jim. Thought I saw something. Flynn shrugged. When Jim thought the silence might suffocate him, he blurted the first thing that came to his mind. My dad had one of these. Jim smuggled the rifle into the house that evening while his wife was in the shower. He closed the safe as he heard the pipes moan when she turned off the water. Jim went downstairs and poured bourbon and orange juice. He slammed it down. Then another. Then without juice. The face of that man wouldn't leave his mind. On the way home he nearly swerved off the road when he saw him again, but in the rear view it was only a tree, barren and leaning in the wind. Before they went to bed, Jim and his wife watched a documentary about serial killers with bizarre fetishes. 
he got up several times under the pretext of having a pee because he drank too much, in which he would open the safe and stir at it, or pick it up and put it to his shoulder. The last time he left the couch he loaded a cartridge into the stock and wrecked the lower lever over and over until he heard it hit the floor. A week later, Jim staggered barefoot through foothills, screaming his throat hoarse and wrenching his rifle in calloused hands. The more stung, the tighter he squeezed, letting the heat in his palms and pads of his fingers spur him on. This wasn't a dream, it was something more, a vision, an epiphany, perhaps a message only he could understand. He wiped the mouth with the back of his hand and felt uneven lumps of thick tissue. There was very little light, but Jim or whoever Jim was now, knew where he was going, letting rage control him, losing inhibition and allowing himself to experience another man's retribution was a high he never wanted to come down from. He fired at the silver curve of moonlight overhead and heard a scream echo through the hills. Then he racked the lever and stirred into the brush. The click it made gave him goosebumps. Jim's wife shook him awake some time later. When he came to, she was sitting up in bed with the sheets drawn to her chest. Her teeth were clenched and her face held an apprehension that let Jim know that he had already said or done something disturbing in his sleep. Nat? He rubbed his eyes in an attempt to show her he had been fast asleep. Natalie? What's wrong? What the fuck is that doing here? He followed her eyes. When he sat up to move the sheet, he flinched at the cold barrel. It was between them and the bed. Jim slept on the couch that night lying awake trying to interpret what these things might mean. He eventually felt silly for thinking it could even have been an interpretation. He stuffed the rifle between the cushions and the back of the couch. At breakfast the next morning he swallowed everything down and forced a smile, a smile as taut as the canvas of a war drum and ready to burst at the stitching. Jim's father was a quintessential gun enthusiast. They'd gone into the desert shooting for as long as he could remember. Hearing the metal targets ping like ricochets in the westerns had been the highlight of many summers, shadows stretching by the fire, while his father's familiar rasp recounted stories from his childhood. He'd tell of shooting water moccasins, catching gators, and picking oranges before the grove hands chased them away. His father's laugh was a siren song that lured spectators into camaraderie. The summer before high school, Jim and his father were returning home from one of their shooting trips. When they were a few hours from home, they slowed for brake lights and scraps of metal scattered across the lanes. A car had slipped the biker and thrown him from his motorcycle. Levi cramped and made Jim stay in the truck so he could attend to the biker, who was in all black trying to crawl to the barrier with little or no ambient light. The desert road back to Flagstaff had very little lighting in those days. Jim beamed with pride watching his father lean over to help the man. He heard the low moan of the rusted Chevy passing their car just before the flood. Then, screeching towers and the scratched metal scream of worn bricks. The outline of a man's head resembled an eclipse in a faint light. The driver didn't move. A few moments later, his head tilted back. Then the Chevy's muffler popped goodbye. An abrupt farewell to Jim's innocence. Jim's father had let him shoot his Evans repeater that trip. That night, sleeping in the itchy blankets the station provided, he went over it again and again in his mind. He could hear his father's voice. See how the sights rise when you breathe? You don't fire while you're breathing. You don't hold your breath either. Deep breath and after three exhale, all the way the rifle will be at its steadiest. You gotta time it right. So when you exhale, you squeeze the trigger all the way. That way the rifle will have as little movement as possible when you fire. If you do it right, it'll make you jump a little. The rifle cracked and metal sang. His father slapped him on the back. Not back, kid. Jim tried to hide his tears from the recoil. Or maybe there were tears at having hit the target. He couldn't tell now. His father was kind enough to wipe at his own eyes and curse the wind. Jim replayed these moments over and over again in his mind, as if concentrating on them could somehow prevent their later futility. Jim had blamed himself. In that confused and distorted line of thinking, children take up by default to blame themselves for failed marriages and abuse. Some detectives brought the rifles they'd taken to the desert almost a month later, and Jim begged his mother to keep the rifle. 
When she refused, he took it from the trunk she had loaded it in and hid it in the closet. It stayed there a few months until his mother, like mothers of all teenage boys tend to do, went through his things. For reasons Jims could never divine, his mother blamed the guns for her husband's death. She pawned it the day she found it. The drunk who ran down Levi Crampton served eight years for manslaughter. Jim couldn't remember what degree and didn't really care. When the man made parole, his uncle called him. He had moved into a halfway house about three hours north. Jim thought of that now and an angry tremor rumbled in his chest. It was similar to what he felt walking through the desert in his vision. About a month after the first vision came another. Crouched barefoot in someone's yard, with little stones pressing into his feet, he could hear crickets and the low and distant hum of traffic. He sighted in on the back of a man's head through a window, breathing, timing his breath while he slowly applied trigger pressure. He heard himself say, What's that you? and squeezed. The rifle's report sounded like the backfire of a muffler. Jim woke with a slight gasp, drenched in sweat. He heard his wife mumble beside him in her sleep. Sliding his legs closer to her side of the bed, he felt it. It startled him, but he pulled the rifle close and lay there, as if he'd just finished making love to it. As night welcomed the greys of morning, Jim backed out of the driveway in neutral and started the engine a little ways down the street. Pressing a bare foot into the pedal, he looked over onto the passenger's seat. The shadows around the weapon looked like black shards of broken glass. Well, we hope that you enjoyed our latest horrific tale. If you want to keep up to date with future episodes, then subscribe to our YouTube channel and like or follow our social media pages. You can also give the channel support by visiting our merchandise store and picking up some of our items. Please also take a moment to support our contributing artists who very kindly lend their talents to the show. Check out the links in the description on how you can do this. Well, that just leaves me to say, until next time my friends, keep it creepy, keep it horrific.